All right, in James chapter 4, the part of the chapter I want to focus in on is right at the end there, starting in verse 13. It says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? And that's the, ser the title of my sermon this morning is, What is your life? And um, we see here in this passage, he's saying, okay, you know, you're saying today and tomorrow, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this, I'm going to conduct this business, I have, I have all these things, all these plans I'm going to do. And he's saying, you don't know what's going to come on the morrow. Yeah. And he says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He says, for you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And what he's saying is don't take your life for granted. Don't take, you know, oh yeah, of course, you know, the average lifespan is, you know, I don't know what it is for, for a male in the United States these days, somewhere in the 70s, probably like 76, 77, or whatever. So it would be presumptuous of me just to think, just to automatically assume, well, of course I'm going to live to be that age. So I'm going to do this and this year and this next year and do this. Now, there's nothing wrong with making plans. I'm, you know, we made a plan for this new year. It's our plan. We make goals of, of what we're working for to achieve. But never take your life for granted. Because we're here, it's very quick. Our life is here and it's gone. And we ought to have an attitude that is, you know, first and foremost, if the Lord will. Having that focus, what is the will of the Lord? And that should be tied in with what is your life. Your life should revolve around serving the Lord. And when you're making your plans and you're doing these things, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. And he says, but now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, the Bible says to him it is sin. He's saying, you know that you're supposed to do good. You know that this is the Lord's will. You know that this is what you're supposed to be doing, but you don't do it. He says, that's a sin. There's many areas of our life that we can see clearly from the Bible that there are things that we are supposed to do. Now, normally when we think of sin, we're thinking about, well, there's these things that I'm not supposed to do, and if I do those things, then I'm committing a sin. That's typically what we think of. I mean, if you say, and, and we talk to people all the time, give me an example of a sin, because you like to engage people in conversation, make sure they understand these words. Believe it or not, there's some people out there that don't even know what a sin is. They never even, they don't know the word. They don't understand the word. Sometimes it's people who, whose English is, is their second language and they're not familiar with the word. But other times it's younger people just not brought up in church, don't know anything about it, don't even know what a sin is. But, um, I don't want to get off on that rabbit trail. But when we talk to people, we say, you know, what's a sin? They'll say, oh, you know, stealing, lying, killing. And, no, and those are sins. That's absolutely correct. But that tends to be our focus. That's like those are the only sins that we have to keep ourselves from doing bad things. But the Bible says that not only is, are those sins, but if you don't do good, if you know you're supposed to do good and you don't do it, that's also a sin. So it's not good enough to just say, well, I'm going to keep myself clean from doing these other sins, from committing these bad acts. That's not enough. God wants you to do something good. He wants you to go out and do work for Him. It's not good enough just to say, well, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't steal and I don't kill and I, you know, and I don't do all these other things. That's great, but that's not enough. You need to do good. You need to do something. You need to put forth an effort. You need to put forth work. If all you're doing is keeping yourself from, from these sins of um, commission, is what it would be, of, of actually committing something, committing an act and doing something wrong, but you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're committing a sin of omission. You're committing a sin by not doing something. And we need to make sure that we're trying to do both. We're doing the right thing and not doing the bad things. And what I want to focus on this morning is what is your life? And this is something I want you throughout this sermon to, to be thinking about your own individual personal life as we're going through this. Um, Paul said in Philippians 1.21, he says, For me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So if you were to ask Paul, what is your life? He'd say it's Christ. To live is Christ. 
and to die is gain. That is someone who's got their focus in the right place. That is someone who knows, who has the right goals. What is your life? Christ. It's not my job. It's not even my family. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Because in our life, there's lots of things that can distract us from doing the right thing. There's all kinds of distractions throughout our life. And they're not all necessarily bad. You know what I'm saying? When I said, you know, my family isn't my life, well, they're a big part of my life, but that's not what defines me, right? That's not what my life is. I love them. I'm going to take care of them and, and everything else. And they are a big part. They mean a lot to me. This church means a lot to me. You know, a friend's leading a lot to me. My other family and other relatives mean a lot to me. So don't mistake what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. But if someone's going to ask you, what is your life? You know, what, what are you doing with your life? Yes, I'm, I'm raising children and, and supporting a family. But I would like to be able to say with confidence, like Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And, and that that is, is what is consuming my time and my energy is, 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 and what I'm striving for is to be able to serve Christ and to do good and, um, and to sin not. Look at Luke 12, verse number 15. Luke 12, 15, it says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And I'll be honest with you, the scriptures that we're going to be looking at, are a lot of them are focused around this one topic of covetousness. Because this has a tendency to be the, the most common thing that people uh, fail at or fall at, is this covetousness and get wrapped up in making money, and being financially successful and looking on things that don't belong to you say, well, I really wish I had this and I really wish I had that. And you're setting your heart and you're setting your mind on these, these inanimate objects, on these things where you think you're going to get happiness, on these things that you think is going to make your life so much better and so much easier. And if I could just get this, then I'll be happy. Then I'll have things I want. And you set your focus and your mind and your attention and your strength and, and everything else on achieving something that's going to be burnt up. Something that really doesn't even matter. I'll tell you right now, there are people that have lived that have had almost nothing. Extremely poor, maybe even homeless, nothing, you know, none of this world's riches, but they are going to be or are extremely rich in heaven because they kept the right Focus. They knew what their life was about because it wasn't about collecting a mass of wealth and food and guns and ammo and everything else. Now look, being prepared is great. And if you have the means to do so, fine, excellent. All, all the more power to you. You know, there's nothing evil or sinful about having wealth or money. Just in general, if you have it, fine. But that should not be our focus. That is not what we're on this earth for. It's not to see who, has, who, you know, I've heard people say this, you know, whoever has the most toys wins. And that's their motto or philosophy on life. My friends, that is a sad, a very sad existence. If that's what you think that, well, if I could just get all these boats and toys and vacation houses and everything else, then I've, I've succeeded at life. That's going to be one miserable life because those things will never satisfy you. No matter how much of that you get, it's going to consume you more than it's going to satisfy you. Because as soon as you get that, you're going to realize how empty that is. Yeah, it's great. Hey, I got this brand new boat. Let's go out. Let's use it. You have a lot of fun for a week. And then what? Then you got to maintain it. Then you got to pay extra money. You got to have a truck. You have all this other stuff. And you, all of a sudden, you start thinking, you know, well, it was fun. And no one really wants to go out anymore. And, that was it. Now you set your mind on something else. And, and it's this, and again, you know, I mean, if you have a boat, you know, nothing wrong with having a boat in particular, but it's what is your focus? What is your, you know, are, are you looking with covetousness to, to just be satisfied with all of these earthly possessions and things that you have? Bible's telling us very clearly in Luke 12, 15, a man's life consisteth not 
in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what your life is about. What is your life? Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. So this guy's being blessed tremendously. He's got all this you know, wealth of massing. You know, his ground's really producing fruit. And he's saying, Well, what am I going to do? I, I'm already full. Right? I, I, my storehouse is already full. Now, instead of saying, well, God's really blessed me. Maybe I could be a blessing unto others. I've got plenty for myself. Why don't I just start, you know, I could help other people. He says in verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall, shall those things be which thou hast provided? He's saying, you fool, you know, you think you've got everything all laid out. You think you've made this perfect plan. I know, and isn't this tied in exactly with what we saw in James 4? You know, where you're making your boastings about, about the next day and about these years saying, you don't even know what's going to come on the morrow. And he's saying, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to fill up these great storehouses. Then I won't have to work at all. I'll retire. I'll live on easy street because I'm all taken care of. And God's saying, you're a fool. He's saying, you think you've got all of this wealth. You've got all of this stuff. And guess what? I'm going to take your life now. And then, and then all of this stuff that you've accumulated, who's it going to go to? What good is it going to be? Nothing. You've worked your whole life and, and just, you know, and people focus even on the retirement and everything else. They focus on, oh, I've worked, I've worked, I've worked, and now I'm just going to not work anymore. And it's like, you know, that's, he, God told Adam that he was going to work until the day that, he, until he returned into the dust. Amen. And that's what I plan on doing. Um, but, you know, God wants us to work, but I'm not going to get off into that, that rabbit trail either. I want to focus on what is our life? What, what are you all about? You know, don't be so wrapped up in the world's goods and in his covetousness. Let's keep reading here because there's some more great truths in Luke 12. He says um, in verse number 21, so he ties this up. He says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And that's key, saying, you know, he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If you happen to have this wealth, if God's blessed you and you have some, you know, the stuff stored up, I'm not saying that's a sin, but he's saying he's not rich toward God. You know, he, does, he wasn't living his life for God. He wasn't doing the things he should have been doing. And like I said, I mean, when you have all this stuff, well, what more, do you, what more could you possibly need? And uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute too, because too, there's another scripture that's going to address that. Look at verse number 22. Let's keep reading. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse, storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? So he's saying, you know, first of all, he said the life is more than meat. It's more than food. And the body is more than, than raiment, than clothing. God takes care of the birds. The birds don't have to have a big storehouse, right? They don't have to have this big food storage, this big vault that's got all this food and everything else stocked up for them in order for them to survive. Yet they survive year after year after year after year after year after year. God takes care of them. And he's saying, God's saying, I can take care of you too. You don't have to be so focused and so intent and so worried about, all, about, about amassing this wealth and making sure you're taken care of for yourself and, and, and you know, making sure that you have all of this abundance. He's saying, trust me, have faith in me. You are way more valuable than these birds. God has a lot more importance on you 
than on the creatures and the other beasts of the, of, the, of the earth. God cares way more about you. And if he's taking care of them really well and making sure that they're fed and making sure that everything's going fine for them, how much more is he going to look out for you? So he's saying, I don't want you to lose focus here. I know that you need to eat. I know that you need to be clothed. I can take care of you, but I want you to listen to me and to obey me. And when I tell you to do good and you don't do it, you're sinning. I want you to go out and do these things. And if that's going to cut into your time where, you know, you'd be amassing this wealth, then so be it. He's saying, I'll take care of you. I don't want you to have to worry about that. Let's keep reading. In verse number 25, he says, And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Neither be ye of doubtful mind. He's saying don't doubt God. Don't worry about these things. God will take care of you. Verse 20, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's why he says in verse 33, to sell that you have. He's like, look, don't worry about amassing all this wealth to yourself. Sell it. Give alms. Help people out. What good is it going to do you anyways? Help others out, and that, and in so doing that, you will provide for yourselves bags which wax not old. Because right now you're trying to fill your bags with, with all this stuff. He's saying you can have bags that they're never going to get old. You will have treasures for yourself in heaven by doing good things and helping other people out and not being so worried about yourself all the time. And you start focusing on other people and their needs and what they have and say, hey, I've got all this wealth and abundance. This person needs, needs a lot of help. I'm going to help them out. God's going to look at that and he's going to see your heart's going to be in the right place. Your heart's going to be um, focused on other people. It's not going to be focused on just, well, how much can I get for myself? And that's where your treasure is going to be then also. God sees the good that you do to other people and he'll reward you for that. Especially for those that have no chance of ever being able to reward you again. When you go out and help people that, that they have nothing. And you help people like that, that and, and you sell things that you have and give alms to help those people out, there's no way you're going to get anything back from that person. God sees that and he, he's going he's gonna to get you back. God will make sure that you get rewarded. Flip back to Luke chapter 8. You're in Luke 12. Just flip back a couple pages of Luke chapter 8. What is your life? What is your life all about? If someone were to ask you, what's your life about, what would you tell them? Think about that. Luke 8, verse number 5. There's a parable of the sower. Very, very, very familiar parable of the sower. Let's look at verse number 5. He says, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So he's talking about here, he's explaining the parable saying, you know, the very first um, instance that he mentions, 
are, are referring to people that hear the Word of God. They hear the Gospel preached. They hear God's Word. But they don't receive it. They don't believe and get saved. Now, this very clearly explains what this parable is. People misuse this and abuse this portion of Scripture all the time. This is the only instance of a person who's not saved. All the rest of them we're going to read are people who get saved because they believe, because they've received that seed of God's Word. And it's important to know this in order to understand this parable at all. And it, he, he very clearly says, lest they should believe and be saved. Let's look at the next one. It says in verse 13, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So Satan didn't remove the word from them like he did with the other group. They received it. And they were glad. They were happy. Hey, they got saved. Great. They believed it. They received God's word. But, it says, And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Verse 14, and that which fell among thorns are they, are they when, or which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, what we see here in verse 14 are people who, they get saved. They receive God's word. Okay? But the cares of, and the riches and the pleasures of this world choke them out. And this is where we have to be careful with our focus and what our goals are. And, and all of these things can be distractions for you living a righteous and godly life and living the life that God wants you to live. Don't get distracted. Don't get, get choked out. And what happens when you get choked out, it says, in the pleasure of life, and bring no fruit to perfection. He says, you're, you're not going to bring forth any good fruit because you're going to be distracted with all of these other things. It's going to consume your time. It's going to consume your energy, and you won't be serving God. And if you're not serving God, you are not going to be bringing forth fruit. And um, it's, it's that simple. We only have so much time. We have a limited amount of time in the day, in the week, in the year, in our lives. What are you going to do with that time? What is your life? Galatians 2.20, you don't have to turn there, says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Christ is our life. Christ should be our life. He is our life. If you have eternal life, it's because of Christ. That Christ, that, that life that's abiding within you, that eternal life, is Christ. Christ, is, if you think about yourself and say, what is my life? It should be Christ. Christ is my life. But as I mentioned in... Um, you know, going back to James 4, stay in Ephesians 5, James 4.14, where we started off, says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And he's warning us, saying, okay, what's your life? It's a vapor. You see just the, the steam that comes up off when you're cooking something on, on the stove, you're boiling water, a steam comes up and it goes away. And that steam's only there for an instant and it's gone and there's new steam coming up but that steam it rises gone rises gone rises gone he said that's what our life is he said our life is a vapor we're here for a short period of time and then we're gone and in the grand scheme of things it really is a short period of time and none of us know how long we will live some of us have already been blessed with with many years under our belt others have not we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring I've known people who were Christians and who were doing good works that have died at a very young age. We don't know. You, I mean, 
we just have to rely on God and trust that he knows and whatever his will is, hey, if you're doing what's right, you will be walking in the will of the Lord. If you're, if you're just decide, I'm, I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to follow the Bible, I'm going to trust in God, we know and, and trust and believe that God can save us and protect us and, and, and watch over us and we shouldn't have to worry or fear about evil. But if something were to happen and you're in the will of God, then, it, then it's got to be according to God's will that, that He's going to allow you your life to be extinguished. But we don't know that. We don't know when that day is going to be. So we just have to live every day hopefully in God's will that, that we're doing what He wants us to do. Because, um, but anyways, the, the point I want to make with our life being a vapor and appearing for just a little time and vanishing away is that it's short. And it seems like the older you get, the shorter it, se it seems to be. And time just goes faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And um, man, I d just thinking back now, I'm only 37, but I think back on all those years, like, man, I, I used to think like 37 is so old. And it's like you're never going to get to that stage in your life. <laughs> And it's just way far away. But every day passes, every year passes, and it comes and it goes, and it's fast, man. It, it keeps going. And, and I'm trying to figure out, man, what am I going to do with my day? I have all this stuff to do. And it's not enough time to do all the things that I want to do. And I wish I had this mindset when I was 20, <laughs> right when I got saved. Because I would have accomplished way more since then, but I didn't. And but but it doesn't matter where we're at right now is what we need to is what we need to focus on. I'm not going to live in the past. That I'm not you know I'm not going to count. Well, I'll be able to do that later in the future. I don't know if I will be able to. I have to be able to work on the things I need to work on right now. Now we just looked at a bunch of Bible verses describing how our life should and should not be defined. We should not be caught up in the cares of this world. We should be doing the things of God and, and relying on Him. Our time on this earth is short. Now I want you all just to think back on your life up to this point and think about some of the things that you've done. And, and how does that line up with the Bible? Does it line up with what the Bible says that it should be? And just, and just think for yourself on, on your own personal life and the years that you've had up to this point. And think about the things that, that, that you've done. And you think about your great accomplishments in your life. Now, when you think about those things, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Are you thinking about that time that you killed that, that last boss on that obsolete video game? You know, obsolete from last year. Or from <laughs> you know, we spent all those hours and all that time playing those video games. And it took you a month, man, to get to the end. And you finally beat it. And you made that great accomplishment. Is that one of the things that you guys are thinking about? But when you think about back on your life? Does that pop in your head of something that you've done? Or are you thinking about all those Sundays that you spent just sitting in front of the TV and watching football and watching all these old seasons? Hey, they were new at the time, right? But all these old years and decades of watching a sport, of watching football, that mean nothing today. Does it really matter? Though I'm from Chicago. Does it really matter that the Bears won the Super Bowl in 1985? <laughs> does, that, does that matter? Or any any of the sports teams? I mean, what about last year's Super Bowl win? What about the year before? Does it really matter now? Do you remember? Does it remember? Yeah, I don't even, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't even tell you. I mean, there's, so, there's been so many years. And I'll tell you what, though. This is, I, I'm, I'm going to be bringing up all things, as I'll be honest with you right now, all things that have, that have happened in my life. Okay? And the areas where I've wasted my time. But I know I'm not alone in these. Now, you personally may not have had these, these individual things, but what about, you know, have you thought about all the time that you've spent and all those seasons of the old TV shows? Watching hours and hours of movies that Hollywood puts out or all, the, you know, all this stuff where you just, what does it do for you? Nothing. I mean, I could tell you all the, the I had on DVDs like this Seinfeld episodes and all this other stuff and just watch them over and over again. And how much time of my life has just been spent in vanity, in nothing. And, and you'd be like, well, I, I watched all of them. I saw the whole season. I didn't miss one episode. I saw them all. What a great accomplishment. Is that what you're going to be thinking about when you look back on your life and you start thinking, man, what did I actually do with the time that I had here on earth? 
Is that even going to be a thought to you? Probably not. Most people don't think about those things. You're probably thinking about bigger things that you've done in your life, actual accomplishments, things that you've worked hard towards and achieved, and things that actually have a little bit of a lasting value that can stay with you through your life, and, and high points and you know, accomplishments that you've made that, that have been good, especially if you're thinking about, in biblical terms, of things that you've done for God and people that you've led to Christ and changes that you've made on other people's lives that have helped them get better. When you look back on your life, you want to be thinking about those things. How did I help my family? How did I help my friends? How did I help the church? How did, you know, how did I reach the lost? This is what you're going to be caring about when you're breathing your last breaths if you get to a point where you can look back and reflect on your life. Don't get so caught up in these distractions. It wastes your time. It's, it's, it's useless. The Facebook, the video games, the TV, you know, all this stuff that can consume your time. It consume hours and hours and hours of your time. You don't get that time back. If you want to do a lot of great things, hey, it's going to take a lot of time. These goals that we have set out for the year, guess what, for the church, they're going to take a lot of time investment. It's not going to come just by chance. We're not just going to show up next week and there's just going to be all these people here and they're all going to go out soul winning and, and we're going to get all these salvations just because it just happens. It doesn't happen by chance. It requires a lot of work. And in order to put the work in, you need the time. And in order to have the time, you need to get rid of the fluff in your life and the stuff that's useless and that that's, serves no purpose. Our time is precious and it's short. And we need to keep that in mind, M myself included. I've got a million things to do and I don't need to keep being distracted with these things. But we have this flesh that wants to draw us away from serving God. Because serving God is something that your flesh is going to be like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's cold outside. I don't want to go out and knock on doors. There's snow on the ground. I don't want to do that. I want to sit in my warm house. I want to drink hot chocolate and sit by the fireplace. That's what I want to do. Okay, you can do that. But you're not going to accomplish nearly as much when you do those things. And am I saying it's wrong ever to take a break? No. I've already preached that we need to, you know, that's why God instituted the Sabbath in the first place. You know, I think it's one of the reasons, actually there's many reasons, but we need to take a break. We need to take a rest. But don't trick yourself into thinking that you always need a rest. And you always need a break. And now, oh, I deserve this. I, you know, look. You do what you want with your life, but there is going to be the judgment seat of Christ. And that is going to be the ultimate point where you can look back on your life and what you've done. Because that is where God's going to have everything that you've done in your life is going to be presented before you. And he's going to try it with fire. And then you'll see what really had lasting value. And I guarantee you those TV shows and movies and everything else that you might be spending your time with, those are going to be burned up immediately. And there's going to be nothing left. And we're here for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years on this earth. We're going to be with God in heaven for an eternity. Eternity. You worry about getting, man, I want to make sure that I could retire and I've got enough, I've got enough wealth built up for me to live for an extra five or ten years without doing any work. Wow, isn't that so great? I've worked my whole life to have five years, ten years so that I don't have to do any work. And then you're going to die and all of your works are going to be burnt up before the judgment seat of Christ. And then you have an eternity with nothing. I mean, amen, you're saved, you're in heaven, that's great. Praise the Lord. But the retirement plan I want to be saving up for is in heaven. That's, if you're smart, that's what you're going to be laying up for. Don't worry about this lifetime. I'll work my fingers to the bone and not have anything for a stupid retirement if that means I'm going to be having a much better retirement for all of eternity. We need to have the right focus. What is your life? Think about it. Ephesians 5. Look at Ephesians 5, verse number 15. 
The Bible says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming, you know, you're, you're taking advantage of your time. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. He says we need to redeem the time. The days are evil. We need to redeem the time that we do have. He said don't be unwise and, and get caught up be, being drunk with wine. And, oh, God, if I could just get back the time and the money that I've wasted on, on alcohol, there's so much more I could... I, it, this is why I'm preaching this sermon, okay? So that you don't get caught up in this. And don't, no, you don't, not everyone here, especially girls, listen up. Because you don't have to make the same mistakes that I made in my life. Don't ever get caught up in alcohol. Or in booze or beer or wine or any of that stuff. It's going to waste your life. It's going to waste your money. It's going to cause you to do wicked things. And it's going to get you away from God. Amen. Don't ever get caught up into it. It's deceitful. It's going to make you sorrowful. It's going to cause you to do things that you would never want to do on your own. It's horrible. You should be filled with the spirit. Not with those spirits of devils. Your time is precious. The things that you do are, are important. And the time that we have here shouldn't be wasted. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I love, and uh, we did this through the book of John. John 21, 25 says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Jesus did not waste his time. If you could write books that the world can't even contain, the amount of books that could be written because of all of the works that Jesus Christ did, Jesus Christ is the example that we need to follow. Obviously, he's perfect and we're not, but that is who we need to be looking to. He didn't have a home. He was out doing the work all the time. How much sleep did, they, did that man get? I don't know, not very much. He was praying for hours. He was teaching. He was healing. He was focused on other people all the time. All the time. <clears throat> this is part of the struggle that I face daily. How can I possibly get everything done that needs to get done? I know I need to read my Bible. I know I need to pray. I know I need to go out soul winning. I know I need to, you know, study. I need to do all of these different things. I need to work. I need to support my family. How in the world can I get all of this stuff done? And I've seen other people get so many things accomplished that had at least as much, if not more things, things to do to consume their time that they had responsibilities, that they had obligations, that they had to meet. And um, the big question is how? How do you do it? And um, hopefully I'm going to give you just a few tips here that will help um, to help you to accomplish more in your life and tips that I'm putting in place into my life and trying to get as much done out of mine because our time is short. I mean, I I'd, I'd had an entire free day um, on Friday and it's like that day just, just was gone before I even knew it. And there's a lot of things I had planned that I wanted to get done and only got like one of them almost done. <laughs> And these, thing, these things happen. I, you know, sometimes you look back, it's like, how did this even happen? But the um, first thing you can do is identify and eliminate the total wastes of time. Think about what's important in your life and think about the, you know, whether it be the internet, or because that's one of the most common things today is just wasting time online. Honestly, that's, I've been guilty of that. I think there's most people in, the, in my age group and younger at least have, are, in, are in that um, <clears throat> internet age where it's easy to, to just waste lots and lots and lots of time doing things that ultimately don't really matter. 
and, and are fruitless. Um, identify the things in your life and get rid of them. You get rid of the wastes of time, you can use that same time to do something productive, to do something for God, to do, some, to do things that really matter. Another thing is to have a plan in place. Prepar preparation and having a plan, I think, are very critical and very key. If you want to accomplish a lot for God, you need that plan. That's why I wrote out my plan for the year personally and I wrote out the church goals for the year because with that plan in place, with the goals in place, we have the objective in our mind. This serious thought must be given in advance in order to maximize the efficiency of your time too. Because you don't want to be haphazard with the way that you're trying to achieve your goals. You want to do it the most efficiently so that you, you could maximize your time. One of the ways to do that is make a list. I've noticed for myself when I do have a day, sometimes it happens by chance. A day will come with something I've had scheduled will, will be um, fall through. The plans will fall through. Now all of a sudden I've got this big chunk of time that I didn't think I had before. What are you going to do with that time? And if you're not prepared for something like that, usually what happens is you end up wasting the time. You end up just doing whatever. Because it's real easy and tempting to be lazy and to sit around and to do nothing than it is to actually have something. So if you have a list of things that you want to get done, it's real easy to pick that list up and be like, oh yeah, I wanted to do that. Because I'm always forgetting the things that I want to do. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know if it's because I messed up my brain cells or what the deal is. My memory is getting worse and worse and, um, and I'm still not even that old. So... I'm sorry, Leslie, for <laughs> if I do end up getting older, <laughs> my brain really starts to go with my memory. She's always finding things for me. But if you have a list of the things that you want to do, then you tend to get a lot more things done. Because you can pull out that list and be like, oh yeah, I've got time. Now I'm going to get this done. Now I want to get this done. And you'll just get these things done, whatever they may be that you need to get done. You'll get a lot more done that way. Um, when I'm thinking and praying regarding my goals every day. So when I'm thinking about the things, especially the things of God, and it's another thing I've incorporated, I'm gonna be, I pray every single day now about, about my goals, about the things I want to get done, to keep them fresh in my mind. If, if, there, if it's a daily thing and you're thinking about these, even if you don't have the time, you know, there's days where I go to work and I have to be at work all day. I wake up, I drive down to Mesa, I come back and I'm gone all day and I don't have the time to go out so and I don't have the time to do a lot of other things. But I'm still going to pray that day about, you know, being able to accomplish everything I want to accomplish. So I keep those things fresh in my mind so that way I won't even have to resort to a list because I'm always thinking about these things. So when, time, when the time arises, oh, hey, I could get this done right now. Because I've been thinking about it. It's fresh in my mind. It's going, I'm going over it every day. It's something I'm keeping at the forefront of my mind and I'm keeping as my main objective and my main focus in my life you're a lot more likely to be able to accomplish those things then. Even just at random points throughout the day then, as an opportunity presents itself for you to give the gospel to someone. Are you even going to think about giving the gospel to that person if you're, not, if you're not thinking about, in general, about soul winning and about God and things of the Bible and, and, and everything else? When you come into contact with someone, you know, the more you're doing work for God, the more you're praying, the more you're in communication, the more you're reading the Bible, the more likely you are to be talking about those things with other people then if the only time you hear the Bible or read the Bible is when you come into church, well then for the rest of your week, when, you go, when you're going around and talking to people, you're not even going to be thinking about those things. It's not a big part of your life. <laughs> multitasking is key. If you can, and I'm terrible at multitasking, but I try to figure out the ways where I can do this. And the way that I do it, the way I get a lot done with my time is during driving. I, drive, I have a big drive to Phoenix a couple times a week. So I have time to, you know, read the Bible, which I actually listen to the Bible because I don't read while I drive. But um, I, I listen to the Bible on audio and I can do a lot of Bible memorization during that time because it's quiet time, it's alone time, it's just me. And it doesn't take that much focus to drive. I mean, you're, you stay in your lane and you put the cruise control and that's it. So I listen to the Bible and I can do other things with that time instead of just driving or instead of listening to stupid talk radio or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm actually trying to accomplish things and learning more and growing. But whatever it is in your individual day, you just have to, you have to come up with that on your own. 
figure out a way to be able to, to multitask. One good thing to do is, actually I don't have it in my pocket right now, carry a, a pocket Bible around with you everywhere you go. And um, if you don't have one, I'll get one for you. I don't know if we have any. It doesn't look like we have any on the shelf. But um, I have got a little New Testament. And it fits right in my pocket. And there are times when you can be out standing in line somewhere, going to a store, you know, what, whatever it is. Uh, throughout your day, you can be somewhere and you, got, you go to doctor's office, you got to sit and wait. Instead of picking up the magazine, open up your Bible. And if you have it with you, then when those situations arise that you didn't even realize, you didn't think about in advance, oh, I'm going to have this extra time, hey, I've got my Bible. And if it's always on you, you've always got it and you could always, you could always read it and use it. Um, that's another good way. That's another just little, a little tip to have that with you. That way you can work on your memory verses or get more reading time um, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when you have a little bit of time to kill. Now, our time on this earth is precious and short. How, how would you define your life? When you get to the end of your life and you think back on all the things that you've done, what would you like to look back on and say that you've accomplished? Think about that. Because that will help you with your goals. At the end of your life, when everything's done, and you look back and you say, what did I do? What did I do with my life? What would you like? Because we're all still alive and sitting here. We all still have time. No matter what you've done already in the past, you all still have time to do more right now because you're still living and breathing. God's not done with you yet. I believe that if God was done with you, you'd be gone. God's not done with you. He's got more work for you to do. Think about those things. Think about what you would like to have seen yourself do if you could look back and say, well, I led a thousand people to Christ. That would be worthwhile. I could look back at that and say, you know what? I, there's a lot of things I did where I wasted my time, but at least I did this. You know, I, I, did, I did something meaningful. I changed lives. I helped people. You know, whatever it is. What, what you look back and think about the things. If you look back and say, this is what I would like to see I've, I've done. That will help you to form your goals and then work on getting those things accomplished. Use your time wisely and don't get too wrapped up and caught up in the cares and the riches and the covetousness of this world. It's a daily struggle. It's something you have to deal with all the time. But try to stay focused on what's important. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. God, I, I struggle with this every day of my life, Lord, with, with not, being, not wasting the time and with all the responsibilities that I have, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help me and help everybody here to accomplish great works for you. God, you've warned us to those that know to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. Lord, we know that we're supposed to do good. We know your will. We know what you want us doing. I pray that you would please Help us to do those things. Help us to overcome the slothfulness and the laziness in our flesh. Help us to overcome that and to push harder and to do more work for you. God, if we get tired, if we get weary in this lifetime, it'll still all be worth it in eternity. Lord, help us to be able to keep pushing ourselves day in and day out to do more to get things accomplished for you, dear Lord. And help us not to, to give in to our flesh, to our weak flesh, but to, to walk in the Spirit daily. Lord, we love you, and I thank you, and I pray that you would please just open up our understanding every day a little bit more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.